And uh, I'll just pray real quick. Jesus, thank you for this day. Bless this service. Bless every heart. Um, We love you. We lean into you. We ask for your presence today, Jesus. We ask for healing in this house today, in Jesus' name. We ask for grace to be released in this house, in Jesus' name, for, for blessing and fullness of joy in this house, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We honor you, we love you, and we lean into you. Bless this word, and bless every person that is sitting here today, and all those listening online, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. Amen. I want to talk today, um, well, before I, before I give you my sermon title, I, I, I was thinking about something. I was thinking about, anybody ever use your, your Google Maps or your GPS, and you start driving somewhere, and you get a little sidetracked, <clears throat> and then it has to recalibrate, recalculating, <laughs> recalculating route, recalculate. And it begins to take you on another, or like, there's been times, um, I remember I was just worshiping. It's not, it's not the greatest idea when you're by yourself to get lost in worship and you're driving somewhere that you've never been. Uh, it's fun for a minute until you realize you went about 50 miles past your, <laughs> the spot where you're supposed to, you're like, this is desert, this doesn't look familiar. And then you look at your GPS, recalculating, recalculating. And uh, I think... As I look at scripture and I, as I look at the words in red, it recalibrates my heart. And it brings me back to what is most important. And I'm also reminded of our phone. We have this awesome compass on our phone. And, you know, how many know where, I mean, we may be, maybe you're all geniuses. I don't know. How many can you point to where north is right now? Awesome. Got a bunch of people right, a couple people wrong. It is, yes, it is this way. North, yeah, I know, right? Initially, you know, um, I remember growing up, and any time I would think about this, my mind was like, well, I know Mammoth Mountain's that way, so I would, must be north. And I was wrong, that's west. (laughs) And how many times do we think we're moving in a particular direction, but we're actually going the wrong way? Until God recalibrates and and recalculates us and moves us and realigns us and moves us in the right direction. Oh, somebody say amen right there. (laughs) And so I want to be recalibrated by the word of God today. And, And this is kind of what's been happening as I've been reading the scriptures in Matthew chapter 5, I feel like this is, this is the bread and butter of the gospel. This is what it's all about. And, and if you don't know anything, know this. Um, this, is, this is where it all lies. And so I want to talk my st- sermon title, I guess, if it has any kind of title, I guess you could call this blessed. Say blessed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed. And uh, what is blessing and what is blessed? You know, blessing is it's a favor or gift bestowed by God, uh, which thereby brings joy and happiness into our life and heart. It's fa- a favor or a gift bestowed by God. Blessed in the Hebrew and the Greek actually means, or as all my scholars, it means to be happy. Come on. Blessed actually means to be happy, and it also means to be spiritually aligned. That's a good word. To be blessed is not just to acquire things and to to get all these things that, um, that social media says that we need. Being blessed is actually aligning your heart to God. Being blessed is when we have an internal joy that can't come from outside circumstances. And Jesus told us how to live a happy life. And he told us how to live a blessed life. And, and if, if I learn from anybody, I want to learn from King Jesus. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's a weightiness to his sermon here. There's a weightiness to his words here. And I pray that we would listen to the words and, and allow it to transform and change us. And so it says in Matthew chapter 5, 
And this is after he just gathered his disciples and called them, drop your nets, follow me. All these ones begin to follow him. In chapter 5, it says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated with his disciples, he, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he began to teach. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hallelujah. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you and falsely accuse you for my sake. Oh, come on, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Rejoice. Rejoice. Really? Rejoice, he says. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's like, drop the mic. <laughs> That's a powerful statement. And he, and he continues and he goes on and, and he, he really um, drives the point home. But I want to talk about the Beatitudes and this, this uh, being blessed and what it really means in the Lord's eyes. And how to be happy, how to be blessed according to heaven. And so we start this verse, we start this whole uh, Beatitudes with verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. What does this mean? This means blessed are those that are desperate for God. You know, you, you think about the times that you've gone to the city or third world nations and you see people that are, that are starving and they're hungry and they're begging for food. And, and they need something to fill their stomach. It's like there is this like longing that you can have inside of you like that for Jesus. Like, and not that you're spiritually bankrupt, not that you don't have a relationship, but it's like it's this mindset of I'm not satisfied with yesterday's bread. I'm not satisfied with yesterday's filling. I must have more. Like I know there's more of him today. I'm hungry for more of him right now. I'm desperate. There's a desperation in me. And desperation will, will move you into this passionate prayer life. It'll move you closer into this place with Jesus. Come on, somebody. Isaiah 66, 2, it says, For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look. Who wants to be this one? But on this one I will look. On him who is poor. That's the same, uh, same expression or the same uh, verbiage that Jesus was talking about, being poor in spirit, not, not physically poor. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. This is the one. <laughs> this is the one that the Lord begins to draw close to. And it is this desperation, it is this cry in my life, Jesus, Lord, I need you. I, I am happy with everything that you've blessed me with. I'm, I'm so excited for all that you've done and all that you are. But God, I need you more. I'm desperate for you right now. I think of the story of the woman who shows her faith to Jesus in Mark chapter 7. I love this story. It says, from there he arose and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and, and wanted no one to know it. But he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. And she came and she fell at his feet. And the woman was Greek, a Syrophesian by birth. 
And she kept asking him to cast out the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And you're like, gosh, that was a little harsh. He's actually not. He's, he's speaking in kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't his time to go to the Gentiles yet. And he was using uh, expressions that they understood and they can understand in this time and age. And so, but I love it that this, this woman understands that. This Gentile woman understands that it is not his time to go to the Gentiles, but yet she has faith. Don't, don't ever mess with a praying mama. <laughs> She's like, I, under, I understand that it is not your time, but just say a word. I know you can do it. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but yet even the dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon was gone and her daughter was lying on the bed healed. Come on! This is desperation. Desperation from a distance. Like what happens when we... When we throw off the religious facade and we say, God, I need you. I just need you more than life. I need you more than anything. Jesus says, this is the key to happiness. This is the key to success. Is, and he started all the Beatitudes with this. Poor, be poor in spirit. Be desperate for him. I get excited about this because this is, this is it. This is what Christianity is all about. You think about the woman with the issue of blood. She was carrying shame. She was ridiculed. She was sick for many years. And she hears that Jesus is walking through town, and she says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. And so she, like, butts through and scoots through all these people, and, and they're probably like, lady, just chill. Like, back off. <laughs> and she's like, no, i got to get in there. She doesn't even, like, get his attention. She doesn't even lock eyes with him, but she just touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus feels it. He, he senses. He says, who touched me? I felt faith go out of me. Power went out of me because somebody touched me with faith, with desperation. Like, do we come to church? Do we come to God? Do we come to our our Daily time with him, with desperation, with Jesus, I need you. I don't understand everything, but I know that you're the God that parts the Red Sea. I need you. Amen. Do we come to him like this? Or is it just routine? Is it just mundane, boring religion? Because that ain't going to get us free. I remember meeting this little, sweet little grandma in the countryside of Mongolia, and we were doing some meetings, and we were seeing some healings and stuff. And, and, uh, and this little sweet grandma, she must have been, you know, 86, 87 years old. And she, she came in, like, with a cane and with leg problems, with back problems, and with these, with these glasses that must, I mean, they were, like, they were, like, three inches thick. Like, they were, I mean, she was, like, practically blind. And she comes in, and she asks for prayer the first night. And so we say, of course, you know, we're just praying for this sweet little grandma. And, and her eyes get totally healed. And she takes her glasses off, and she breaks them. I'm like, duh, duh, duh. no, but she breaks them. She had so much faith, and she could totally see. She gets totally healed in her eyes. And so she comes back the next night. She's, she's, her eyes are healed, but she's got her cane. And she's walking, and she said, like, can you pray for my back? Of course. You know, so we all pray for her back. Her back gets completely healed. I'm like, are you kidding me? Come on, Grandma, you're amazing. And then she comes back the third night, and she's got still her cane, and she's got problems in her knees and her feet. And so she asks for prayer, and she gets completely healed. Hallelujah. And she's, she gets like, she's in perfect health now as an 86, 87-year-old woman. Come on, Lord. And so a few of us were talking to her afterwards, and I'm like, we're like, wow, like that is amazing, like the faith and what is in you to just believe. And she said, you know, she just, she said something that was so, so, so powerful and just kind of marked me. She just said, hey, in Mongolian, of course, 
Um, she said, but if you will just trust Jesus and look to him, he'll always be there for you. <laughs> if you will just, be- and, I, and here I am coming in as Mr. Missionary, Mr. Preacher, but yet I learned so much more from this sweet little woman, this sweet little old grandma that had a, just so much faith and so much desperation. Come on, desperation moves you into the miraculous. Desperation moves you out of religion and into passion. And Jesus said, you will be happy. You will be blessed if this is the stance you take. Come on. Reminds me of that old commercial. It's a, it was, a, it was a, a beer commercial, but it's, it's perfect. It's, it was the Dos Equis commercial, right? And it says, there was the old guy, I forget his name, but he said, stay thirsty, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I feel like that is what the Lord is saying to the church. Yeah. Stay thirsty, my friends. Don't let religion destroy you. Don't let religion and all your failures and your past take away your passion. Stay thirsty, my friends. Look at your neighbor and say, stay thirsty, my friends. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want, I want a longing in my heart for, for more of God. Amen. I want a longing. And, I, and I, I feel like this is a recalibration. This is an alignment, a spiritual alignment. That if you will listen to the words in red, it will, it will literally transform your life. You want to be happy. You want to live blessed. Then you become desperate. You become like this little grandma. You become like the woman who showed her faith. You become like the woman with the issue of blood. You become desperate above all else. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The second thing, so that's first. It says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, come on. Number two, blessed are those who mourn. Say mourn. For they shall be comforted. Amen. This is a promise. For the one who's dealing with grief and the one who's dealing with loss and the one who's dealing with pain, Jesus says, I will be with you. Psalm 34, 18 says he comforts the brokenhearted and he saves those that are contrite in spirit. I love this. This is a promise in the scriptures. But, but blessed are those that mourn. I think of, I think of you, Joyce. Um, blessed are those who mourn. The Lord is with you in a really tangible way, in a real way. And, and this is the second thing that Jesus lists. He says, blessed are those that mourn. And I think he, he writes this, and he's writing this to the Jewish culture, to, the, to all these followers, and to us, I think for two, there's two reasons. Um, the first thing is this. Many people do not know how to mourn. Many people do not know how to grieve. And what we know how to do many times as Americans and what we know how to do many times in a lot of different cultures is we stuff it. And we don't want to experience the sting of this, of this situation, the, the pain that this will bring. And so what we do is we stuff it and we try to look at other things to, to make us laugh and to avoid the subject. And so we stuff the pain, we stuff the grief, we stuff the trauma, we stuff the loss, but it begins to make us sick on the inside. The more you stuff trauma, the more you stuff pain, the more you stuff grief, it, it just gets lodged in your heart. And, and eventually you have a sick heart. I did this as a, as a 14-year-old boy, uh, young man. Uh, you know, my parents got divorced, and it was it left me with questions, left me with hurt. And then my brother uh, died on Mammoth Mountain, and I was so mad, and I was so sad, and I had so, much, so many questions. But as a young 14-year-old, I didn't know how to process this, and so what I did was I stuffed it. 
I, I buried it. And I tried to do the best that I could. And then I, and then I realized I couldn't do the best that I could. And so I started drinking and doing drugs. And because the pain kept trying to pop itself back up. And many in our world today, and especially in the last two years, do not know how to grieve. And do not know how to mourn for, for, for seasons of brokenness and seasons of, of trauma and seasons of loss. And we try to pretend that everything's okay, but yet our heart is totally broken. And so we go to the doctor and we get all kinds of medications. And medications, they're just band-aids. But Jesus is the healer. I want to go to Dr. Jesus <laughs> above any other physician. <laughs> He is the great physician. He is the greatest doctor. And he's the one that knows how to heal our hearts and our soul. Hallelujah. So don't stuff the pain. But he says this. I mean, think about it with the context of what we said. Remember, blessed means happy. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who mourn. Why? Because you don't. You're not allowing the trauma, the loss, the pain, the grief, the past to hold you down anymore. You are free in Jesus. And you understand this. We understand this as believers that Jesus Christ has overcome the grave. Hallelujah. And greater is he in us than he that is in the world. Isn't that a good word? Comfort, you know, he says that he will comfort us and he will comfort those that are dealing with pain and loss and grief. And comfort is to give strength. It's to give hope to. Come on. And we know that the Bible says that, well, Jesus said that I have to go, but I'm going to leave the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Come on. And so when you're grieving, when you are in pain, if you will adjust your heart and turn your heart to, to him, he says, I will comfort you. The comforter, the Holy Spirit is going to wrap himself around you and totally heal you. This is the gospel. And so I just feel like a lot of us in, in America, in the body of Christ, we just, we just need to get real. We need to be authentic and we need to get healed. Because there's happiness in that. There's joy in that. Come on, somebody. So blessed. Say blessed. Happy are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This, and there's a flip side to this as well. So this is, this is the natural grieving process, the natural process of loss, of trauma, of all this stuff. This, there, this has to do with that. But there's also a flip side to it as well. And the other side of this mourning has to do with repentance. Come on. It has to do with repentance. And he said, I'll be with you. I'll comfort you. Think about all these amazing Verses in the Bible. First of all, let's look at um, Psalm 51. This is a powerful psalm, a prayer of repentance and humility. Yeah. And this is after David has just done horrible things. He slept with Bathsheba, had a man killed to cover up his sin. And Nathan comes and calls him out. And it was this recalibration. It was this recalculating moment for David. And he, be, he was getting lost in the things of this world and, and, and the things of the flesh. And all of a sudden, he came back to what was important in this moment. And you see this in his prayer. You see this in his heart. And he says, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. And I've done this evil in your sight, that you may 
be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in my hidden part you make known your wisdom. Purge me, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hallelujah. Make me hear joy and gladness that my bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And here is the famous Keith Green song. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Come on, somebody. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O Lord, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit. Woo. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a good word. That is David coming back. And Jesus says, blessed is the one who turns back and repents. Think about Luke 15, the, the prodigal son. He spent everything, spent all of his dad's money and all of his inheritance and, and on everything, on worldliness, on everything that money could buy. And then it came to nothing and he found himself sleeping in the pig pen. And he began to live in shame and he began to live in condemnation and began to live in guilt and he began to think about his dad. And he began to think about even the hired servants that probably had more than him in this current state. And so he says, maybe, maybe if I go to dad and maybe if I, if I just, sit, you know, just grovel and, and what just, maybe he'll take me back. Maybe he'll make me one of his hired hands. Right? And so he comes back with this heart of repentance, this heart of, of I'm sorry, I, I screwed up royally. Like his heart is totally broken. And then the father runs to him. See, this is what I love about Jesus. This is, this is the heart of the father. He doesn't, he doesn't run at him with a stick and beat him. But when, when, the, when the son's heart is in a broken, in a contrite, in a humble place, the father runs to him and wraps his arms around him, puts the ring on his fingers, the sandals on his feet, say, hey, we're having a barbecue. Come on. Why? Because repentance brings joy. Repentance brings happiness. It's turning from the things of the flesh, turning from the things of this world, and turning back to Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I, I think that, that that boy was truly comforted by his father in that story. I'd encourage you to reread it, Luke chapter 15. He embraces him. He hugs him. He loves him. And we know that the older brother became jealous. Where's my barbecue? I've been serving you. I've been doing everything. And where are my sandals? Where's my ring? Do not allow a religious spirit to come upon you. Do not allow a spirit of comparison to come upon you. Where, where we compare our lives with other believers. We compare our lives with other businesses. We compare our lives with other people's blessing. Don't do that. And the father, the father has the most beautiful and perfect response. He said, you are, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But your brother was lost, but now he's found. Come on, that's reason to celebrate. Thank you, Jesus. So blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn. And this 
last one for today. We'll do some more next week. But number three, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Who wants to inherit the earth? (laughs) That's a pretty strong verse right there. They shall inherit the earth. What is this talking about? What are the meek? The meek is the humble. It's humility. It's, it's, it also has to do with this context. It has to do with self-discipline, but more so humility. And we know that the Bible has a lot to say about humility. Uh, Proverbs 16, 18, and 19, it says this, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. James, I love the book of James. Uh, James 4, 6 through 10, but he gives more grace. Oh, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. What does he do? He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I love how he starts, verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil. He is the proud one. Resist him, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's powerful. That is a humble heart. And that is what the Lord is requiring of us in this time and this age right now. Can you say amen? (laughs) Humility. Humility is the way of the kingdom. It is the way of the kingdom. And the world wants us to be proud and puffed up and and boast in all of our accomplishments and and tell everybody when we're right and tell people when they're wrong. But that is not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is humility. It is humble yourself. It is the upside-down kingdom. This is... This is Jesus. He says if a person gets mad at you and, and angry and hits your face, he says, give them your other cheek. And that's, that's a very hard thing to do when somebody has wronged you. And that's, that goes beyond just getting smacked in the face. But what if they deal you wrong? What if they do a bad business deal? What if they steal something from you? What This is this is. Jesus is, is really making it simple. Like the way of the kingdom is the way of humility. The way of the kingdom is, is allowing Jesus to fight your battles. This is the kingdom. And he will. Like he is the greatest warrior. He is the warrior of warriors. And he says, submit to me, resist the devil, and he will flee. Hallelujah. Uh, Luke chapter 18 This is a perfect example of of humility. Luke chapter 18, and uh, team, you can go up. We're going to sing a song in just a second. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give my tithes of all I possess. I and the tax collector standing afar off would not as much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to the house, to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility. Humility is freedom from pride. Freedom from spiritual pride and arrogance. Believing what God says about you. It takes great humility to believe what the Bible says about you. People are like, oh, that's, that's just pride when you... No, it, it's actually humble when you believe God's truth about you as well. To believe you're never going to amount to anything, you're just a no good, dirty, nothing sinner, that is not humility. Humility is also looking through the eyes of the Father at your own life and seeing who you are in His eyes. You're a child of God. You are loved. You are chosen. You are called for such a time as this. You have the goods. You have the skill set, the gift mix to overcome in this season of life, to bring victory, to bring breakthrough to your family and to those around you. The Lord has equipped you. That is humility. But it's also freedom from spiritual pride and the pride of the world. God says, happy is the one who is meek. first three verses, I learned that I need to stay desperate, I need, I need to stay repentant, and I need to stay humble. This is the way of the kingdom. And if you will just tune into this just a little bit, lean into this, it will begin to recalibrate your heart. And I promise you, you will go north. <laughs> you will get to your destination. If you listen to anybody's words, listen to these. And Jesus begins to, he continues to teach and gives them these powerful lessons and these words. But I love what he says in Matthew, just a, just a little bit later in Matthew chapter 6. chapter 6 verse 26 look at the birds of the air for they neither sow nor they reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not more valuable than they which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature they're probably all shaking their head like nobody he says so why do you worry about your clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like these lilies. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. Come on, say, do not worry. The worry that the world wants us to worry about everything. The news, the false prophets, like Dennis was saying, that wants us to worry about everything. Worry and fear, it just begins to steal your joy. But he says, do not worry saying, what shall we eat and, and what shall we drink and what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. And here is the kicker. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added to you. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Hallelujah. 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Obey the words in red. Stay humble. Stay desperate. Stay repentant. Let's get free of emotional pain and all the stuff that's held us back for years. Let's be free. Yeah. And seek him and turn our eyes to him and have this desperation once again in our hearts as a church. I believe we're coming into one of the greatest reformations and revivals our world has ever known. But it starts with us. Desperation starts in the house of God. Humility starts in the house of God. Repentance starts in the house of God. Tears must start in the house of God. Joy then starts in the house of God. We can't expect joy to hit our streets before it hits the house of God. And so I just want us to worship and just posture our heart back to King Jesus. He is our rabbi. He is our master, our teacher, our everything, our life, our savior. Recalibrate your heart to him. Come back to the words in red today. Come on, let's just sing to him. Let's worship him. I believe the Lord is in this room. Worry is just leaving right now in Jesus' name. Anxiety is leaving right now in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Panic is going in Jesus' name. Fear is going in Jesus' name. The worries of tomorrow are going in Jesus' name. Desperation. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you.
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my soul to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. You're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my
need you. Lord, we're desperate for you. We love you and we long for you. God, I pray a blessing over every person in this room. God, stir up a hunger in this room. Stir up a desperation and a passion. We love you, Jesus. We honor you. Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and close service. You're free to go and get your kids. And there's anybody left <laughs> but if you want to if you could just pray over somebody next to you as we close this just ask them if they need any prayer today and just bless them bless them in the name of the lord thank you jesus bless this day lord thank you for every person that came we love you jesus amen